Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, a uh, lot of the people had questions based on uh, the signs in the sky with Revelations 12. What are your What's your opinion on that? In my book, Shadows of the Beast, I deal at some length with the exegesis of Revelation chapter 12. It is the Midrashic Pesher of the Nativity narrative. In the Nativity, you had Herod, a monstrous figure, trying to kill the baby so he could stay king coming out of the woman. When the baby comes and the baby is rescued, then Herod goes on the warpath and kills the rest of the male babies in Bethlehem. The Antichrist will come in the same character. This is a Pesher interpretation of the Nativity. He will do the same thing. He's identified with the seven heads and ten horns, Herod being a major, major figure of the Antichrist, Herod the Great. He tries to kill the baby. The baby's rescued. He makes war with the rest of the offspring, kills the babies in Bethlehem. So the Antichrist will try to preempt the rapture, destroy the faithful body of Christ. The man-child is rescued. This is the Greek word harpezo, raptured actually. And then he becomes enraged with the woman and makes war with the rest of her offspring. Herod then turns against the babies in Bethlehem as the Antichrist will turn against people Israel and try to kill any believers who are left after the rapture. That's what he's going to try to do. He'll become enraged with the woman and make war with the rest of her offspring. This is why in the Nativity, in the nativity narrative, it says that Rachel mourns this kind of thing uh, for her children, and that it applies it to Herod. Well, that whole episode in the nativity is going to be replayed. It is a figure of what's going to happen with the rapture, with the Antichrist, and with the rescue, and what is going to happen after the rapture. It is a Pesher interpretation. In our book, Shadows of the Beast, we deal with this, and our book, Harpezo, we deal with this, and in various other teachings, including a teaching on the Nativity and the Return of Christ. Well, let's go further with this. Now people are taking this and are interpreting it in light of some kind of astrological configuration to do with Virgo and things of this nature in September. This is the same cheap, ridiculous brand of crackpot theology that we saw in the Blood Moons hoax of Mark Biltz. There's been a lot of attention recently about the so-called Blood Moon Theory, originally conceived by Mark Biltz of El Shaddai Ministries. In fact, as we speak, John Hagee's book, Four Blood Moons, which is basically a retelling of Biltz's theory, sits on top of Amazon's bestseller list. Let me first explain what this theory is for those of you that haven't heard it yet. Joel 2.31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Mark Biltz wondered if this verse could simply be referring to a lunar and solar eclipse. Following his curiosity, he went to the NASA Eclipse website, which has a compiled list of all lunar and solar eclipses dating from 2000 BC to 3000 AD. Using the NASA site, Biltz saw that there were a number of solar and lunar eclipses in the future. The ones he focused in on were the lunar tetrads. This means a series of four lunar eclipses within a space of about two years. Biltz then compared the dates of these tetrads against the Jewish calendar. He discovered that many of these tetrads, as well as other solar eclipses, fall on Jewish feast days. Biltz wondered if such occurrences had happened in the past. He found six occasions in history that the lunar eclipse tetrads have coincided with Jewish feast days. Cross-referencing these dates with Jewish historical events, Biltz claimed the following connections between these tetrads and significant events in Jewish history. 
For example, he says that the tetrad that occurred in 1493 through 1494 corresponded with the Spanish Inquisition. He says the tetrad that occurred in 1949 through 1950 corresponded with the 1948 War of Independence. And he says that the tetrad that occurred in 1967 through 1968 corresponded with the Six-Day War. Viltz and John Hagee suggest that because, according to this model, significant events in Jewish history have transpired around the time of Blood Moon Tetrads, the upcoming Blood Moon Tetrad of 2014 and 2015 will herald significant events related to biblical prophecy, citing that these eclipses are fulfilling the sun, moon, and star signs in the Bible. The question is, how does this theory bear up against biblical scrutiny and common sense? The answer is, not very good. And the following are just a few reasons why. The first thing we need to critique is that what is being described by Biltz and Hagee is the same thing as what the Bible describes. The Bible speaks of the so-called sun, moon, and star sign several times. Here is an example from Revelation 6, 12 through 13. And I beheld, and when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Also from Matthew 24:29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Examining the full texts about this event show that in addition to the sun and moon going dark, the stars also go dark. The Bible describes this sign as a global darkness that covers the whole planet. Whatever this is, it will not simply make the sun and moon go dark, but also the stars in the sky. This is obviously something more than an eclipse. If I were to guess, it would have to be something in the atmosphere that blocks out the entire sky altogether. Or it could be a supernatural event that causes this universal darkness. The only way that Biltz and Hagee seem to get around this is by quoting Joel 2.31 most often because in that verse only the sun and moon are mentioned. However, if you look 21 verses before this, you will see that Joel also intended his readers to know that the stars would go dim as a result of this event as well. Joel 2.10 says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. It is also made crystal clear by God in Ezekiel 32, 7-8 that universal darkness is what is meant here. It says, And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven, and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon the land, saith the Lord God. So unless Biltz and Hagee want to try to explain how these eclipses will make all the stars and every other light in the sky dark at the same time, then they should admit that what they're talking about is not the same thing as what the Bible is predicting. We also see from the other mentions of this event that it includes an earthquake. And as we've seen, John called it a great earthquake. Joel said, quote, the earth shall quake before them. This is the same problem. This great earthquake is an integral part of the so-called sun, moon, and star sign. There is nothing about an eclipse, even four of them, that would cause an earthquake. In addition, it should be obvious to anyone reading the verses that we have quoted that these events occur simultaneously, on the same day and at the same time, and it's literally impossible for a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse to occur simultaneously. All you have to do is look at why and how these eclipses occur, and you'll see that that is not a possibility. So this theory in no way fulfills the biblical sun, moon, and star sign, but perhaps it's just a means of God to warn Israel of coming events. In other words, Perhaps because, according to Bilt and Hagee, the last time these tetrads occurred near Jewish holidays, significant things happened to Israel, perhaps significant things will happen again in 2014-2015. So we are setting aside the idea that this has biblical significance and looking only to see if we should expect this tetrad to be a warning to Israel of some kind, even though it's not about prophecy. The first point, when reviewing the historical accuracy of Biltz's claim that Jewish history seems to converge with lunar eclipse tetrads that fall on Jewish feast days, we find that it's not very accurate at all. So the first thing that we need to do is examine Hagee and Biltz's assertion that these tetrads actually lined up with significant events at all. So often we simply take for granted that this is true, and as we will see, that would be a huge mistake. Did you know that there were actually two other tetrad events that fell on Jewish holidays that Biltz found in the NASA computers? Well, he did, but he doesn't like to say much about those because even according to him, 
nothing significant happened on those two occasions. Right there, that should give us pause. Okay, so how do we know that this upcoming Tetrad in 2014-2015 won't be another dud like the other two that they don't like to mention? Based on these numbers, so far almost half, almost 50% of these Tetrads on Jewish holidays don't mean a thing, even by their own admission. Another point is that the dates of the historical events for which these Tetrads supposedly correlate do not seem to correlate very well at all to the dates of the Tetrads themselves. For example, the Spanish Inquisition actually started some 15 years before the 1493-94 Tetrad and ended roughly 350 years later. They try to give this some credibility by saying that what the Tetrad is really connected with is the so-called Alhambra Decree issued on the 31st of March, 1492, which officially expelled the Jews from Spain. But even then, the first eclipse didn't occur until over a year later, and the last eclipse over two years later. So unless you call being off by a year God's way of predicting something, then this isn't a match. The next so-called match is supposed to be when Israel declared its independence in 1948 and won the war for independence the same year. The dates of the 1949-1950 Tetrad, again, didn't occur until over a year later and didn't fall on any of the dates of Israel's victories or on the day that the UN recognized them as a state or any other significant date. Trust me, if there was any significance to the actual dates of these Tetrads, you would have heard about it. But the best they can do is, as we will see in the next one, coming within 10 months of an event. So yeah, the last one they say occurred in conjunction with the Six-Day War. But in reality, it didn't start until 10 months after the war ended. And the last eclipse didn't occur until a full year after that. Again, these three obvious non-matches look even worse when you consider that they have already thrown two sets of historical tetrads in the trash because they couldn't find any historical events to match them with. So these three represent the best of the best, and that is pretty sad. So within two years is close enough for them. And nowadays, apparently, close counts not just with horseshoes and hand grenades, but also blood moon theories. If Bilt and Hagee are really suggesting that God uses these tetrads as a means of communicating to Israel about coming events, where were the warnings about the far greater and far worse events that the Jewish people have faced? Why didn't God warn them about the Holocaust, or 70 AD, or the expulsion from Rome, or the following persecution? What's more interesting to me is what you have to leave out in order to believe this theory. Why did God pick the Spanish Inquisition to warn them about and nothing else? And if this was a warning, why did it come a year too late for anyone to do anything about it? Furthermore, why are some of the tetrads denoting good events, while others bad events? The Spanish Inquisition right next to the victory of the Six-Day War. There seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. The next point. Israel uses a lunar calendar, and they base their feast days upon the phases of the moon. Logic would dictate that because of this fact alone, lunar eclipses will fall on Jewish feast days with some regularity. In an article published by Answers in Genesis regarding Biltz's blood moon theory, they commented on the rarity of total lunar eclipses following on Passover and Sukkot in this way, quote, No, it's really not that unusual. Remember, a lunar eclipse happens only at a full moon. We don't follow a strictly lunar calendar today, but most ancient people, including the Hebrews, did. Their months began with the first appearance of the crescent of the new moon, which is a day or so after the modern definition of a new moon, when the moon and the sun are in longitudinal conjunction. Reckoning from this point, 14 days later, or the 15th of the month, always coincides with a full moon. The article then discusses the frequency in which lunar eclipses fell on Passover and Sukkot, the same feast days as in the blood moon theory. They start off here by mentioning that so far in the 20th century, this has happened 37 times. Quote, we can say that all 37 of these lunar eclipses coincided with Passover or Sukkot. This is about one-sixth, 37 out of 230, of the 20th century lunar eclipses, which is about what we'd expect because Passover and Sukkot happened in two of the 12 months. The relatively high frequency is a result of definition of the 15th day of the month on the lunar calendar. Therefore, again, the coincidence of lunar eclipses with these two observances is more common than Biltz realizes. So do you understand what they're saying? They're saying that lunar eclipses are so common on these particular Jewish holidays that it's occurred 37 times just in the 20th century. They are so common that Biltz and Hagee have had to essentially say, okay, yeah, eclipses on these Jewish holidays do happen all the time, but how about two eclipses within two years of one another? Oh, that's common too? Well, how about four eclipses within two years of one another? Oh, that's common too? Well, how about we throw two of those away and only look at the other three and twist those a bit, and then we'll have something to write a book about. On the whole, the blood moon theory proposed by Mark Biltz and John Hagee 
falls short of the biblical standards required for the sun, moon, star, and earthquake sign that's supposed to herald the beginning of the day of the Lord. It fails to demonstrate any real and lasting correlation with Israel's past, and it seems little more than fluff and hype. In conclusion, I actually agree that significant events are on the horizon for Israel, and even possibly of biblical proportions. But to suggest that any significant events which might occur in the next couple years are in any way related to the tetrad eclipses of 2014-2015 would be akin to me saying that my team won the Super Bowl because I wore my lucky jersey. Thanks for your time. It's just an absolute baseless nonsense. It has no serious theological basis or merit whatsoever. I, I, I looked at uh, uh, CNN yesterday. And they said this whole phenomena, the blood moons, some are thinking it's the end of the world. Others are saying, take your money out of the banks. The dollars are going to be obsolete. Others are saying, oy vey, the bomb, Iran, are you Meshuga? Are you crazy? <laughs> well, I have the man that is going to answer the question as to what is going on. Is this it? Is it what CNN said it might be going on? His name, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, best-selling author of two books. Uh, uh, one is called The Harbinger. Many of you have read it. The other is The Mystery of the Shemitah. But I want to find out his best spiritual assessment of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, any of you interested? Yeah. Me too. Okay, now I know that you are going to... I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, by the way, ahead of time. I believe that I, 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 I am going to push my friend, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, to move into a spirit of revelation. I'm going to push myself to move into a spirit of words of knowledge and healing. I believe it's going to be a combination of the prophetic word and the miracles of God. What more could you want except maybe Jesus is here now. <laughs> but uh, Jonathan, a couple terms I, I, I want to get straight uh, from your two books. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, what, is, what are the harbinger and what is the mystery of the Shemitah? The harbinger is an ancient mystery. It's the, what happened in the last days of Israel, ancient Israel, before judgment came. Nine harbingers or prophetic signs, warnings, uh, things to come, appeared in the land. And they were warning Israel. Israel rejected them and they were destroyed. The amazing thing or the stunning thing or the scary thing is the same nine harbingers of judgment that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel are now reappearing on American soil. Some have appeared in New York City, some have appeared in Washington, D.C., some have involved the President of the United States. They are happening specifically, exactly, and continuously. And since the Harbinger came out, they have not stopped. They have continued to manifest. This is a warning sign of a nation in danger of judgment. And out of that comes the Shemitah. The Shemitah is a mystery from the Bible that goes back over 3,000 years. And that is that God gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai. He said, every seventh year, you will have a Sabbath year, no working, no sowing, no plowing, all that. And on the last day of that year, and that year is called the Shemitah, on the last day of the Sabbath year, every seventh year, comes Elul 29 on the Hebrew calendar, day of wipe out all financial accounts, wipe clean, debts wipe clean, everything's wiped clean. This was to be a blessing. But when Israel turned away from God, the Shemitah turns from a blessing to a sign of judgment in the days of Jeremiah. I, 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 I know. When I, when I read about it, when I'm just reading the scriptures, I look at it as blessing. And it wasn't until you pointed out other scriptures that it depends on how the nation is doing. It even says that in the Torah, when it's given, it says that if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen. They'll, you'll be removed from the land, but the land will rest for, for all the years it didn't rest. So it becomes a sign of judgment concerning a nation that has known God, that has turned from God, that strikes the blessing sustenance, the financial realm, the economic realm of that nation. And the big question is, could this still be in effect or could it manifest this pattern that God gave? And the amazing answer is yes, it has 
been manifesting throughout our lives. Every one of us has been affected by it. It has given the determination, the timing of the greatest crashes in Wall Street history, the rise and fall of economies, the rise and fall of nations, even the rise of America and what could be the fall of America. It even gives the, the exact timing of events down to the day, the hour, and the minute. And it actually also gives the parameters of end time events. Mark Biltz was left looking like a public stooge and a self-made one when his blood moon's nonsense was proved to be nonsense. Nothing happened. Uh, and although it was marketed by World Net Daily and all of this, nothing came of it. Well, it's going to be the same. The problem is when you have these crackpots saying these ridiculous things, when something of real prophetic significance happens, people is going to think it's just another false alarm. These people are doing the devil's work. It becomes the boy who cried wolf syndrome. It is not a good thing. It is not edifying to the body of Christ. It is not exegetically based. It is a nonsense, just like the blood moon's hoax. Don't believe these silly things. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for your question. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcasts and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea, it's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.